with coronary artery disease uh, both in the male as well as the female population and soon India is going to become the coronary capital of the world and uh, the surgery for coronary artery disease started uh, on beating heart and later on it was Favillaro who popularized the uh, on pump surgery and for the next uh, so many decades uh, off pump surgery uh, uh, went into the background till it was uh, revived again and uh, here we see that the mortality of on pump surgery initially was somewhere around more than 10 percent and uh, it took over two decades for it to come below uh, and now it has been steadily decreasing uh, and it is now somewhere between one to two percent and the long term results of on palm surgery they have been excellent and uh, the benefit of on palm surgery has been seen to be appreciable over a period of more than three decades but at the same time uh, it was a couple of decades ago when uh, the surgery of off palm surgery was revived again and there was a lot of interest and uh, mechanical stabilizing devices and intracoronary shunts uh, were used to stabilize the heart and uh, more and more procedures uh, were performed off pump and this is the profile of our patients and we usually operate patients uh, from the second third decade onwards uh, and we have operated up to the ninth decade and uh, uh, we do around 800 coronary bypass surgeries every year and the elderly patients they are usually uh, having more uh, incidence of uh, hypertension and pulmonary comorbidities and uh, this is uh, the profile of our patients uh, uh, that was between 2000 to 2005 and at that time we were operating more and more patients on pump and gradually uh, with the more experience uh, we switched over to off pump and at that time we were uh, doing more surgeries all, almost all the patients who fell in the elderly age group they were operated all, uh, off pump and uh, most of the younger patients they were operated on pump and then a uh, lot of expectations were there from uh, off pump technique because it uh, advise, uh, it uh, uh, avoids the adverse effects of cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, the however limitations were that uh, because of the motion of the heart uh, sometimes we, we can face hemodynamic instability and the quality of the anastomosis and completeness of revascularization was doubtful so gradually all these issues were uh, uh, tackled one by one and we started using mechanical uh, stabilizing devices and intraluminal charts and the anesthetists they became more and more comfortable and more experienced in dealing with the hemodynamic instability and uh, gradually we started operating more and more patients uh, off pump and this is a uh, meta-analysis of uh, 42,000 patients uh, from the STS database and they uh, showed uh, improved uh, morbidity and mortality in those uh, patients who were performed off pump surgery and the results were even better for those uh, patients who were female. And then uh, we have so many uh, randomized trials and meta-analysis which have shown that uh, the short term and uh, immediate results of off pump surgery are much better than on pump surgery however they failed to convincingly prove the long term benefits of off pump surgery this was because uh, the statistically there were less number of patients in all the studies and also the, the incomplete revascularization was an important factor because most of the surgeons they were not comfortable in completing the revascularization on the lateral side and uh, most of the surgeons they were more comfortable uh, uh, putting grafts on the anterior surface and the posterior grafts and also uh, the, the learning curve of the surgeon was quite long and then we had a group of patients uh, who had 
acute myocardial infarction and also had associated heart cardiac failure. And the big question was uh, whether we should operate these patients on pump or off pump. And then various studies showed that the mortality in patients who were operated on pump was four times higher compared to patients who had a normal ejection fraction. And then um, there were studies which showed that uh, those patients who were operated off pump, they had a much lower operative mortality. And uh, therefore, we uh, started operating more and more patients of pump. And also, there were various studies which showed that uh, although the mortality and morbidity associated with off pump surgery in such patients was much lower, the mean number of grafts was also low. And then, um, there are a lot of papers that have been published. Uh, which support uh, of pump surgery in high risk uh, patients and those patients with acute myocardial infarction. And over the years, uh, you can see this is our graph that initially we were operating very less patients of pump, and then gradually from 2004 onwards, uh, almost 100% uh, uh, of the patients uh, and they are operated off pump. And uh, I present to you an uh, overview of uh, 5,540 patients. 832 patients had ischemic heart failure, and 883 patients had acute myocardial infarction, and 249 patients had acute myocardial infarction and heart failure both, and 602 patients had renal failure. And as the ejection fraction of the patient decreased, the NYHA class and the Euroscore increased. And then we had a group of patients who had both uh, ischemic heart failure as well as uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction. And among those patients who had acute myocardial infarction, 97 patients, they, had, they were in cardiogenic shock. And most of the patients had triple vessel disease and uh, the associated comorbidities like hypertension, acute uh, myocardial infarction, left main disease and uh, renal dysfunction and uh, we, the tendency in our uh, unit was to operate the patients with acute myocardial infarction as soon as possible and uh, this is the time lapse between the onset of myocardial infarction and the time of surgery and most of the patients they reported to the hospital late and maximum number of patients were operated within 8 to 72 hours or 3 days to 1 week after the onset and uh, the troponin and eye levels were uh, t uh, noted before taking the patient for surgery and initially there was a tendency in our unit to uh, hold on the surgery uh, for those patients who had a very high troponin eye levels if the patient was hemodynamic stable and uh, we saw that uh, the patients who had uh, low ejection fraction uh, the more and more and more number of patients had ejection fraction below 25% uh, if the surgery was delayed more than 48 hours after the onset of uh, myocardial infarction and also in those patients who had very high troponin eye levels the ejection fraction was below 25% and uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, coronary pattern we face especially in patients with uh, diabetes the vessels are more diffusely diseased and there are multiple blockages and also more number of vessels are uh, calcified and uh, uh, we get a lot of help from the anesthetist and uh, they uh, apart from monitoring the hemodynamics they monitor the pulmonary artery pressures and uh, especially when the patients uh, they are having their lateral grafts uh, they change the position of the patient from time to time and uh, with ju judicious use of inotropes uh, they uh, help us in performing the grafts. And the sequence of uh, revascularization was uh, uh, the internal memory to LED was preferred first and then after completing the anterior grafts we proceeded to the posterior grafts and then uh, last of all the lateral grafts and the ramus uh, was usually performed last of all. And the mean number of grafts uh, in uh, the patients was 3.2 uh, 
uh, in those patients who had triple vessel disease while uh, the overall uh, mean number of grafts was similar in all the patients uh, who had ejection fraction either below 25% or even those above uh, 50% and uh, uh, we saw, uh, we, there are also studies which support that uh, the results of total arterial revascularization of pump surgery, they are comparable in diabetic as well as non-diabetic patients and uh, we preferred arterial grafts uh, wherever possible and as the long term results of arterial grafts are uh, better compared to the venous grafts and uh, uh, lima uh, graft uh, it has shown that uh, if we use internal thoracic artery the long term uh, 5 year survival is 2.9% whereas in the case of venous grafts it is only uh, the mortality is 18% and uh, in patients with intramyocardial uh, LED we dug out the uh, intramyocardial uh, uh, artery and uh, this is the uh, intramyocardial artery which we located just near the apex and then we used epicardial retractor to retract the artery and uh, put in intracoronary shunt and uh, previously this was uh, intracardial LED was thought to be a contraindication to of pump surgery but no, not any longer and then uh, last of all we performed the uh, OM grafts uh, and uh, we, uh, especially in patients who had uh, uh, ischemic heart failure and bulky hearts, uh, we had to take a lot of trouble and after putting the uh, LED and uh, the grafts, uh, then gradually we uh, gently lifted the heart and uh, uh, lowered down the head end of the patient and performed the uh, revascularization and even uh, those patients who had intramyocardial uh, OM graft, uh, required OM revascularization, we dug in the intramyocardial vessel and then we put in the intracoronary shunt and uh, particularly uh, I am very fond of uh, using sequential grafts whenever possible and uh, especially when the patient uh, had uh, uh, calcification of the iota, we try to use as much of uh, sequential grafts as possible to uh, avoid uh, touching the iota. And uh, in all the patients where the aim was to uh, achieve complete revascularization and uh, uh, it was uh, in more, almost all the patients uh, uh, we never left a graft because we were performing off pump surgery and uh, we never had a problem in exposing the vessel or uh, uh, stabilizing the patient hemodynamically for performing a graft. However, uh, in spite of all the, these measures, in some patients who were not hemodynamically stable, especially patients with acute myocardial infarction and poor left ventricular function, sometimes we um, had to go on pump and the conversion rate was overall 28 and this is 0.5% and uh, out of them 21 patients were in cardiogenic shock uh, following acute myocardial infarction and uh, they had a planned uh, on pump surgery and uh, uh, we however did not use cardioplegia we did it on a beating empty beating heart and uh, uh, then four patients had ventricular rupture the, these were patients who had acute myocardial infarction and while performing the surgery uh, sometimes because of the octopus uh, there was rupture of the ventricle from some point uh, which was infarcted and uh, uh, one patient had aortic rupture at the site of uh, partial clamp and uh, the remaining patients had intractable arrhythmias and we liberally use uh, intraaortic balloon pump especially in patients with acute myocardial infarction and uh, those patients who had left ventricular uh, dysfunction and uh, preoperatively we used uh, in 72 patients and perioperatively in 212 patients and postoperatively 26 patients required intraaortic balloon pump and it was seen that uh, 
mostly the patient who had acute myocardial infarction, they were inserted the intraiotic balloon pump before taking up the patient for surgery. And in those patients who had uh, uh, low ejection fraction, these patients were initially they were started uh, without intraiotic balloon pump and uh, while proceeding with the grafting sometimes. Uh, when we uh, were performing the lateral grafts, if at that time the pulmonary artery pressure uh, went up high and if we were, we were having problem in maintaining the hemodynamics, then we inserted the intraortic balloon pump. And the post-operative uh, ICU stay was seen to be slightly higher in patients who had ejection fraction below 25% and also the mitral regurgitation regressed in 60% of the patients and uh, it worsened in 6.2% of the patients and uh, we had renal dysfunction in 84 patients uh, requiring uh, hemodialysis and out of them 46 uh, patients they had uh, pre-operative history of uh, chronic renal failure and uh, stroke was seen in 15 patients the overall mortality was uh, 59 and which is 1.06% and in patients with uh, uh, ischemic heart failure and acute myocardial infarction, the mortality was 2.48% and the cause of death was uh, neurological damage in 1 and intractable arrhythmias in 5, renal failure in 31 and multi-organ failure in 8 patients and septicemia in 14 patients. Then there are various publications which have supported the use of OPM technique in patients with renal dysfunction and uh, uh, we have liberally used the technique of OPM uh, revascularization patient with left main disease you can see and with critically blocked uh, vessels and various uh, studies have also supported this and th there is one uh, group of patients with uh, cardiogenic shock following acute myocardial infarction and uh, on pump surgery uh, has been shown to have mortality of more than 40 percent in this group and uh, incidentally we performed uh, surgery of pump in some of these patients and uh, the intraiotic balloon pump was uh, inserted in the cath lab and uh, when the patient went in cardiogenic shock and the patient they were rushed to the cardiac OT and eight of these patients they required cardiopulmonary resuscitation and it was seen that after inserting the intraiotic balloon pump uh, in uh, some of the patients the uh, hemodynamics settled to the extent that we could perform the surgery of pump also and uh, we immediately revascularized the anterior descending artery and then uh, the remaining grafts were piggybacked onto the um, initial graft and we were able to salvage uh, most of the patients, there were only 9 mortalities in this group. And we, uh, there are various studies which have shown the beneficial effects of OPM surgery in comparison to the percutaneous interventions. And also various reviews have shown that uh, the morbidity and mortality of OPM revascularization is uh, much lower compared to on-pump revascularization and uh, there are various advantages of, of pump revascularization because of avoiding the cardiopulmonary bypass cannot be matched by the advances in the techniques of cardiopulmonary bypass however if the surgery is performed off pump by inexperienced team then the results of the surgery they are not as good and the graft patency may decrease by 10 percent and also uh, the surgeon should uh, perform the surgery gradually he should uh, first simply perform the surgery on uh, straightforward cases and then uh, gradually uh, switch over to more demanding cases and uh, to conclude I would like to say that off pump surgery has been tested through with rigorous process of scientific validation and observational studies and case matched retrospective analysis and randomized control trials have proven that off pump surgery is safe, cost effective and reproducible surgical technique and with experienced uh, surgeons of pump technique can be used safely in all patients who require revascularization except in those patients who are in refractory ischemic ventricular arrhythmias and cardiac arrest and those patients who are hemodynamically unstable even after intraiotic balloon pump insertion and those patients who accidentally have a cardiac rupture while performing the surgery.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this fantastic overview. So, how do you answer the question? The question which was put in your title, is it a passing fad? Uh, in my opinion, it is not a passing fad. Uh, gradually, the surgeon's experience is increasing and those surgeons who are performing high volume surgery and those who are performing it regularly, they feel that uh, off-pump can be performed in all the patients. Thank you very much. Are there any questions and challenges here from the room? Please identify yourself. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Kaushik from Mumbai. Uh, I think the, a grey area exists very clearly. As regards the sicker patients whom we are, uh, we have substituted the balloon pump. Uh, we have substituted the pump with the balloon pump. and. Uh, I am not sure whether in cost terms, even in India, uh, with a balloon pump you increase an ICU stay of 5 to 8 days and uh, the cost of the balloon pretty much approximates that of the pump. So the question arises, in the sicker patients we really need adequate clinical data to show that the uh, off pump is in any way superior. Do you have any answer to this? Uh, I agree with him what he is trying to say. Uh, we used to feel the same uh, when we were in the era between 2000 to 2005. But with more and more experience we have seen that many of the patients who would not have even come off the pump, uh, they fared very well after we did the surgery of pump with the help of intraiotic balloon pump. And uh, usually we have seen that uh, it does not uh, increase the stay uh, too much. Many patients they uh, just required the intraiotic balloon pump initially in the operation room, and once the revascularization was done, uh, within uh, 48 to 72 hours, we removed the intraiotic balloon pump in most of the patients. And if we do complete revascularization in these patients, they are bound to fare well. And if we do incomplete revascularization, then they are bound to stay on, linger on in the ICU. And then they, their bad results are because of the incomplete revascularization. Yes, thank you. Would you have a question? Any other? Yes, please. Yep. Can I make a comment? Dr. Eugene Sim from Singapore. Um, I have to defer from you completely. I started doing off-pump uh, surgery in the year 2000 and uh, probably was doing 90% of my uh, patients uh, off-pump for many years. Uh, I was uh, one of the strongest advocates of uh, off-pump surgery. I co-authored a consensus paper with ISMIC's uh, board in which we advocated uh, off-pump surgery. We really stretched uh, all the evidence possible in order to make the recommendations that off-pump surgery should be done. But I've observed the data very, very carefully in the literature and unfortunately, I think today, there's no clear-cut evidence that in a good risk patient, off-pump surgery really benefits these uh, patients, maybe except for less blood loss. But the overall outcomes in randomized trials have been very, very marginal, half favor off-pump, some go against uh, uh, off-pump surgery. So I think <clears throat> in a good risk patient, the benefits of off-pump surgery are very marginal. So for these days, for a young patient, the low 60, low, um, reasonably low risk patient, you have put the patient on pump, get excellent um, revascularization. However, the role of off-pump probably lies in the high risk patient. And the high risk we have been divided into two groups. High risk meaning high risk for pumps, not because, no, sorry, high risk for cannulation and putting on cardiopulmonary bypass. And the most obvious group of these patients would be those with a calcified aorta where you can in, avoid cannulation, avoid manipulation of aorta, we would def, definitely uh, reduce the risk of strokes. And this is probably the group of patients which would be benefit most and which we will try very hard, if not always, to do uh, off-pump uh, surgery. But I think the evidence at, at this point in time for widespread application is really very marginal and it reflected by the fact that I think 80% of surgeons in the world, outside of, in, in, outside of India, still do uh, surgery the conventional way by uh, using the uh, pump. And that has changed our practice in using less of pump and be very, being very selective. There lies the difficulty. If you are selective in using it, when the opportunity comes or the need comes for you to do uh, off-pump surgery, will you be able to be uh, perform it? 
as uh, well as uh, you should off pump, on pump. Yeah, I think your last point is uh, well taken. Thank you. Again, to reiterate my first point, doing somebody off pump is not to cut costs, it is because we believe that a coronary revascularization is not to be done on the pump. Yes, any views from Australia or America? Tim, I've been observing this as uh, my colleague Eugene Sim has uh, indicated. Look, I think the country it says is going to be the largest coronary bypass country in the world, 1.2 million or whatever. It's about time we, sh we saw some trial data, well organised trial data, from large cohorts of patients from perhaps whatever institutions uh, that you recommend, so that we can get a feel for the national experience. Because, you know, looking at papers, all those publications you present are in US journals and European journals. That's fine, but we really don't know exactly what... We can't answer these questions from your country unless you set up the trial data and uh, actually do and publish and, and present data to us. And not only do we need the, we need the survival data or the, the complication data, but we actually need the graph patency data because that is missing in the large numbers of ISMEX trial papers and. Uh, you know, like Eugene, we try and read through it. This seems to be good, but that you don't really know exactly. We don't have cohorts of 100 or 1,000 that have had this done at a certain time, so we can compare them with a group who's had something else. And until we get the scientific data, I believe it's hard to convince some of us, like my colleague Eugene, and, and uh, me to, to someone else, I don't know what, what the person's going to say, but we really need national data, I think, and good data. So the point is well taken. I think we need to work towards that, uh, especially uh, at the moment when most data from literature as far as off-pump is concerned is very misleading because most data is from people who are claimed to be off-pump surgeons who are actually beginners in off-pump and really do not, um, in my definition of an off-pump surgeon, uh, qualify to, to be an off-pump surgeon. So I think we need to provide you with, with good data. We'll, we will do that. Dr. Cohen, please. I agree entirely with what Brian has said. The problem is, is that if you look at the results of the randomized trials, you know, they're just not near large enough to, to give us the answer. And we spend all our time saying, well, the reason on-pump looks good compared to off-pump is because those guys doing on-pump couldn't do it off-pump and they're just crappy surgeons. Well, that's what the cardiologists tell us. They tell us the reason that PCI isn't any, doesn't it? Well, they just need a little bit of better stent, so it doesn't all count. I, I, you know, I'm so tired of you know, hearing about studies where you did 50 so far so good. An example, again, is the stitch trial. You know, I, I was a tremendous believer in, in the door procedure. We had great results. We could have compared our results to anyone in the world. But the fact is, when you look at an international segment, it didn't make a bit of difference. And so we don't do that procedure anymore. So until you look at, do a randomized trial and get truly angiographic data to see how they are at the end of the year, not the fact they left the hospital five days later. That doesn't count. And the cardiologists criticize for us for that. And we as surgeons do a terrible job doing randomized trials. And I can tell that I'm involved and in head of a unit that looks at it through the National Heart Lung, but we, we do a bad job with it. It's about time we got better. Well, I think on these uh, uh, very interesting uh, debate we had and in these uh, closing remarks, uh, we would like to thank you very much for a challenging topic and um, I hope that in the future we will see some of these uh, randomized studies coming from India. Uh, with this, I would like to thank all the speakers, my co-chairman especially. And